Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. So today, we're going to talk about the EM5 Mark II, EM5 Mark III, as far as how they perform wildlife photography. Now these are these are great all-arounder cameras. They're small, they're compact, they're micro four-thirds. But, uh, you know, how do they perform in a wildlife setting? Now I've used them, I really like them, the way they they perform, but, you know, let's, let's compare them against the the true, I would say, standardized DSLR wildlife cameras, you know. I would say the Nikon D500, 90D, 80D Canons, Sony A7R3, Sony A7R4, those those cameras are notoriously really good in the field. But we'll, we'll do some real, real world usage case here. You know, I don't want to really get into the technical specs so much as you know, just giving an overview of how they perform in the field. Some of the things I see using them versus what the spreadsheets or what these standardized, you know, reviews do. You can go out anywhere and find, you know, the, the details of sensor sizes and frames per second. But if you really get down into the, the nuts and bolts of how this stuff's used, you'll start knowing. So I'll give you one example. Up here are two videos. This is me actually in South Dakota stalking antelope for photography now. Uh, one's with the Sony A7R III, 150 to 600. And the other one is the M5 Mark II along with the Panasonic 100 to 400. And you'll notice right away that the, wow, the, the Sony A7R III is da dancing all over the place. And most people will jump to a spreadsheet or a specification sheet and say, wow, I know why. It's, it's because, you know, Olympus has this world-class stable image stabilization with them and their lenses and that. But in this case, yeah, you're probably right. I definitely would give them that. But that's not the case here, why the, the Sony is shaking all over the place. One of the reasons why is because the lens is so much bigger and I'm facing a 20 mile an hour side to side wind. So the Sigma or the Sigma 150 to 600 is it's way longer. And with the lens hood, it's just it gives that much leverage. So a little burst of wind hits that long, that big and that long of a wind, it just knocks it all that further out. That's just some of the things they are not going to tell you about, you know, and it, and it comes down to usage and that. But, you know, let's go over some of those things as far as how well these perform in, in real world versus, yeah, you can dial it up on a specification sheet. And that's not necessarily going to be the correct answer or what you're going to face in the field because, and there's a lot of things that will probably, I'm going to go over the negative things, which I miss from my Nikon D500 that I used to have. There's definitely some things there, but... So before we do that, let's let's compare these two cameras because there's a lot of people, I guess, trying to decide which one should they get. Now there's the M5 Mark II, which came out in 2016, M5 Mark III, which just came out in November 2019. So we'll, let's get into you know the difference between these and if it's worth an upgrade or what you're gonna gain or miss because there's things I like both about these cameras. I wish I could you know condense them into that, but yeah yeah um differences between m5 mark ii and mark iii so we talked about the ones 2016 ones 2020 so what are the big differences what are the things i like or dislike about the the new camera some of the things you're going to give up so wow it's it's kind of shocking that they do some of these things that they've done with this camera but let's start with the the bad things EVF is the same so if I had to choose between the two I couldn't even tell which one was which in, in my vision of which camera is which and generally when you upgrade a camera they improve the EVF that is it's kind of a downer but it is what it is 20 megapixel they've gone up by 4 megapixels sensor a little better with ISO little better but it's not super noticeable so you're going up somewhat but not huge like in some other cameras where they really boost up the resolution and, and things like that oh huge one so this one's frustrating not the same batteries <laughs> yeah so you get these mixed up a lot in the field 
I can't believe they did that, but uh, yeah, so you want a pair of, you want your camera gear to be the same. So in the heat of the moment, I'm shooting, I'm actually shooting turkey, photographing turkey in my previous video, check that out. And, and one of the things I had to get new, new uh, battery in the camera system, I grabbed, I got a battery pack, I threw in a bunch of these, I grabbed the wrong battery and I'm trying to put it in. That's the kind of stuff that hits you, you know, you bring the wrong battery along and you're out of luck. So frustrating. I don't believe why they did that and I had to buy an extra set of batteries, but that's not so much the bad case as being in the field and you have, you know, parts that don't jive together. And I'm thinking about either getting rid of the AM5 Mark II, selling it and just buying another one of these, or buying something that's totally different that supplements the, the rest of this stuff. So batteries, lighter, cheaper feel. So the camera, it's lighter. It's like 20% lighter or something like that. It's actually a little bigger, a little bigger grip, but it's not a, a metal body like the AM5 Mark II. The Mark III is just lighter and it feels a little bit cheaper. So if you're in that big quality field, like a street photographer, a range finder, you like that, like, yeah, I got a piece of equipment that's worth something old school. They've kind of gone to more of a composite feel. It's not bad. But it just doesn't have that same feel and weight like it's like it's something built to last and i know that's just the feeling i get but it can turn some people off because this stuff the m5 mark ii has a cult following amongst a lot of old school photographer rangefinder kind of guys that just like that feel that small solid feel but you know being that it feels a little less expensive it's not <laughs> so they they listed the m5 mark three i think at like 11.99 and that's that's getting up there in price that's getting up there in price where you know i would have thought a thousand dollars you know 200 200 extra that's that's substantial um yeah uh it's price is going down but you know hey you can still pick one of these up. I mean, if, it's, if you're looking at $1,199 and you got this price tag and you can get one of these for four or $500, you get two of them for the price of this. That might be definitely an option, just with some of the benefits. We'll talk about that in a sec. So, slightly thicker, but one of the things they did reverse-wise, and I'm not crazy about, is the actual ergonomics. They're missing a few buttons up here, and this one has it. And this one's got a little bit better feel. And they put a dial button up here. I'm going to say this right up front. The M5 Mark II is the best, <laughs> best handling camera I've ever felt. Ever. And to mess with the ergonomics a little bit, man, you, uh, yeah. That, I mean, it's not huge. It's doable. But there's a couple buttons up there you've missed. I would say I'd give this a 10 out of 10, the feeling of it. And I've, sh I've shot a lot of different cameras. It just feels awesome. It feels like part of your hand, part of you're able to create and do kind of stuff. This feels a little cheaper, and there's not as much buttons up here, which I don't know why they did that. They put an ISO button here, which it's kind of hard to get to. So i'm going to downgrade it on that if i had to look at you know in the field it just feels a little less slick all right so what's what's some of the benefits a beat up on it the benefits it's lighter definitely lighter in the field so you know as it smacks against you if you're walking you don't feel it as much as this camera and in believe it or not it's a blessing and a curse because i'm like hey this is kind of a little lighter i noticed it so it's slightly noticeable image improvement. It's got a faster focus. It's got a bigger buffer. I noticed all these things. It doesn't jam up like the M5 Mark II. Um, better image stability, definitely. I seem to get sharper images, a little sharper, like slightly more keepers. Just, you know, when you're shooting, you know, things happen and you're like, wow, okay, that, that worked. It's got pro capture mode which is like going back in time. You can, you can shoot something in you know, 80 frames, 60 frames, and then just go back through and look at the one you want to keep. And that kind of got a video roll. Better ISO performance. It's got a 50 megapixel pixel shift, which is this 40, not a huge difference. Um, 
slightly better two times zoom, which I'll show or will show with the groundhogs that I'm shooting, or the rock chucks. Slightly better dynamic range. So everything across the board, for the most part, in the internals is a little better or at least equal. Is it worth another two or three hundred dollars? That's the question. So out on Amazon right now, I could find this one I think for a thousand dollars. I I think you could find this one for like seven ninety nine, eight ninety nine, which is a little steep. And I think they're keeping the prices up there for a reason, you know, to sell this one. So if I had no choice and it was two hundred dollars and I got the money, I'd definitely pick up the new one. But if you can find this, like some bargain bin, brand new, and you find two of them for let's say four hundred fifty dollars, the body only, man, I'd do that. I just go with the same batteries. This is this is one of the things. You know, if you're going to use it as a complete system, if you're going to swap out batteries, not everybody has two cameras, but I use one for video and then one for shooting and vice versa. So, yeah, so that's up to you guys. We'll, we'll get into the differences between, you know, the DSLRs and the other mirrorless stuff. Pretty much handle identically pretty close. It's so close. I bought the new one simply from the fact that I wanted to see the improvements. I shoot this a ton. This is probably my most used camera. My M5 Mark II is my most used camera I've ever used. I've ever stayed, you know, stayed with the camera system. That's it. It just it it fits everywhere, and that's that's kind of the reason why I use it. It's like an everything camera. It's a multi-purpose camera where, you know, if I if my dog was you know running around in the in the carpet or something. I don't usually pick up my D500 and take a photo. I'll usually have a real small lens and snap it, you know, a little zoom or something like that. And it's very lightweight, very quiet and that kind of stuff. So that's one of the benefits. But yeah, we'll get into the comparison D500, D90D cannons and the mirrorless stuff here in a sec. But you guys make the choice. If you have any comments on that, definitely want to hear about it. We'll roll into the, the bigger stuff for wildlife more specifically. All right, so let's let's go over the things I miss from the DSLR world. Now I take these out a lot, and I've had these I've had them the Mark II for quite a while, but there are definitely things I miss from let's say the Nikon world. So low light focus, you know, that is focus speed. That is definitely if there's one thing Nikon and the D500 does that's world class is their focus system. Yes, it is their low light focus. A lot of micro four thirds cameras do suffer from those kinds of things. Um, speed, somewhat focus speed and and accuracy there. So, you know, micro four thirds has a smaller sensor. And one of the main things, the one of the really big things I miss from the bigger cameras, especially full frame is when you're photographing, let's say deer or antelope or something along those lines, I'll kind of put some some images up here. The depth of field, you know, the, it's not so bad. The depth of field, like you can blur out the background on a small bird. That's the reason why you see a lot of like Tim Boyer and a couple other guys. They're shooting small birds, medium-sized birds with Micro Four Thirds, uh, 300 f/4. And the background's totally blown out. It just it's not noticeable. And I find the same thing. I mean, it works very well. But one thing I do miss is if I have something close in the background for a bigger animal, it just doesn't render that default out of focus as well. And I say it does, but it's not quite as well. And so some of the lens selection to get there, you know, some you know, is another thing. So I didn't want to get in too much of the system, but you kind of have to do. And, and that's one of the things where the, the 300 f4, there's only a few lenses. This is probably the two here. This is 100, 300, 100, 400. There's a 300 f4, that kind of stuff. And, you know, you get only two, three, maybe four real true wildlife long distance lenses for the system. So you're kind of hurting in that respect that I miss. You know, if you ever wanted to go big time, it's a little tougher in micro four thirds. And I know people say, well, it's supposed to be small and, and, and compact. And I get that. But there's a lot of other benefits to micro four thirds besides just being small. I mean, the computers and the end software we're going to talk about blows a lot of the other camera stuff away. But um, yeah, so the depth of field, 
roughness, weather sealing, confidence with sealing in the gear. So Nikon D500, D80, you know, these cameras, there's the, the Mark IIs in that from Canon, they, they're world class. So D500, I had no problem. If it was a snow drift and I had to move something, putting it right in the snow drift, you know, less electronic stuff in it. I just felt better. Like they've been doing it for years. They've been building these bodies. They know. So micro four thirds or EVFs, all this mirrorless stuff. Yes, it's it's supposed to be weather sealing, but I have left less confidence in its robustness as far as that. Because there's a, I, I feel there's a lot more electronic stuff going on in here than let's say a typical DSLR, which we'll talk about. And it's one of the benefits, but it's also a con here, you know, as far as being being able to handle the roughness. Um, cold weather now a couple things um size so one of the things size of this if you have big gloves on i've been sitting you know where it's like zero degrees you got to have big gloves you're freezing you're in a blind you're holding out and the d500 fits fine because it's a big grip you get a battery grip you're able to go in and out with the functions here everything's really cramped and, and it's very you got to be very accurate with your button pushes, which with big big gloves you just can't do. You're punching the wrong buttons. Definitely something I miss, you know. Right tool for the right job, but um, doesn't really stop you. You can you can get you know fingerless gloves that you can pop off and that. But the other one, the the other the other aspect is the battery. So cold weather, these cameras eat through batteries. So. Nikon D500, 90D, those cameras, you could probably shoot with a battery grip, a couple extra batteries, you could probably shoot all weekend, and even including video. I mean, you could go Friday, Saturday, Sunday night and not have to probably worry about batteries all that much in cold. Where this stuff, if you're shooting any video or if you're in there and it's, and it's cold, these batteries are small and uh, they're very small, they're tiny. They don't generate it. Plus, because it's mirrorless, it's doing double duty of moving the sensor around for image stability, which the other cameras don't have to do. It has to run an EVF. So it's taking up a lot more juice. And in and, and the cold weather doing that, oh yeah, it's it's beating it up. So I always feel like I have to jump in a bunch of extra batteries with this and, and constantly swap these out just in one day, just sitting in the cold, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, you know, we, we talked a little bit, we weren't going to talk too much specs, but, you know, there is ISO stuff. There is, there is ISO, you know, the noise and the sensor and that stuff. And it is somewhat noticeable when you start getting up there to 3200. I generally don't shoot high ISO stuff. I usually keep it really low as possible. The Nikon D500 and 90D, 80D, they generally have good buffers, especially the D500. I think it's 200 JPEGs. And Mark II doesn't have nearly as much. I miss the, the, the capabilities of that much storage of being able just to blail through and there's no stuttering. Now, Mark III does, definitely has a much bigger buffer and it competes. I think some say that you can just shoot it with JPEG only and just keep shooting. Just keep it down and it will, it will store it if you got a fast enough card, which is great. I haven't found the case. I've been able to stutter it and buffer and have it start buffering, but... I don't shoot that much. I mean, it's it's definitely an upgrade there, as we talked about. Resolution, you know, when you're looking at the 80D, 90D, you know, the 90D especially, it's 32 megapixels. These are stuck at 16 and 20. So there is a resolution, and it goes even worse with the Sony systems that are huge megapixels. So every once in a while, you do miss that kind of thing. That's, that's one of the drawbacks there. Um, so we talked about the drawbacks. So why would I, why would I even shoot this stuff, right? Like if there's that many drawbacks. Well, there's a lot of benefits over over the DSLRs. And first of all, you know, exponentially smaller. Like this is this is a great 100 to 300. This is basically 200 to 600 lens. F 5.6. Even though the depth of field isn't there still get you the speed to get your ISO down. And it's probably one of my favorite wildlife cameras, believe it or not. Um, it is plain a steal. It's like five, 600 bucks. It is my favorite lens to use as a, as a carry around that. Excellent image stability. 
no doubt. It, it's it's mind blowing if if you shoot a Decon, a uh, Nikon D five hundred or Canon, you're amazed at how many shots come in very very sharp with this equipment. It just works, and that's the first thing I noticed. My image keeping, my image keepers for for that. If anything, if I see a blurry image, generally my ISO or my shutter speed's too low, and it's the the animal moved, not my hands, and that. So it's plain awesome, the best, world class, world leading. Can't get any better right now. The biggest one um, advantage is I I shot the D500 in an outing, and I kept scaring away animals. More so, I scared away. Uh, I, I scared away an opportunity. I only had about six to eight seconds, and probably later on, within a day or two, I went and bought. I went and picked back up some Micro Four Thirds gear. Silent shooting, plain awesome. Got to have it. I don't shoot if it doesn't have it. I probably won't shoot it anymore. It's just it's you know. I'll show you how scared the animals are here. I have some photos of animals just balking because um, just my hand movements and that. So I have to be very cautious where I'm at. Silent shooting definitely helps out. Frames per second is excellent. You know, you got the pro capture, which is uh, basically going back in time. The Panasonic G9 does a pro capture a little differently, but it's still the same thing. You can scroll through basic video and get like 20 megapixel images. It's it's bizarre. It's great if you're looking for that decisive moment. Works awesome. You know, bird coming down. You can roll back in time and pick the vi the photo. Now Canon does do that with their, I think it's their six their Mark II of something. It's their mirrorless camera. They do do that as well, and that's a great option. Video inside the EVF now. <laughs> Video on my D500 and the Canon was kind of a clutch. You always had to kind of champ and look and do that kind of stuff, and it just didn't feel very organic. Where this, obviously EVF, this is a lot of mirrorless. I know I'm going through a lot of the mirrorless benefits, but you have to include it in here. I mentioned overall sharper images. You get to review the EVF, you get to review the image right in there. There's no champing. Um, and lastly, probably a big one is the functions within this camera. What makes it a steal is the ability, they have so much software built into this. So you got pixel shift, which is, they have the best pixel shift in my opinion. That and Panasonic where you don't have to, you know, mess around with raw files or anything. It gives you, this is a 40 megapixel, 50 megapixel image, and it just does it in camera. You got to be on a tripod. The other one, I think the upgrades you can do it handheld, and high. They call it high res mode. But if you're if you're looking at something static, you want a, a really good picture. You can do that kind of thing. That's the in in camera software. You also have macro photography where it will do put it on a tripod and it will do 10 or 20 shots of what you want and compile it all in. You don't have to put it into Photoshop and it gives you one image. I'll show that here. Images I did in studio where. It basically came right out of camera like that. Didn't really have to do anything where, you know, it saves time. Anything that's going to save me time in camera that I can do outside of that, out of camera, I love it. And so, yes, software, software. They got all kinds of different composition features and these things. Yeah. So, where does that leave the other mirrorless cameras? You know, as far as the Sony's. Yeah, Sony's A7R3, R4. Those are those are the killer killer cameras for a lot of people. They they swear by them. Now I've shot them. They're they're definitely top notch as far as image quality. So what are the things I miss if I'm shooting this and I miss from you know how I shot the Sony? Well, uh, better EVF. <laughs> these are these are standard run of the mill EVFs. Uh, Sony A seven R three R four are top notch. I don't know why Olympus does doesn't do that. Even in their top models, they don't have great EVFs compared. When you look through an R three R four, it's fantastic. I love it. Full frame depth of field. You know we we talked about you know the subject you know popping and and getting that nice creamy background. Man, you gotta love it. I do miss it when I shoot this, just like I do with the APS C sensor focus tracking now sony's crushing it with the focus tracking there's guys out there with like two hour videos on how to set up your camera for all the different focus tracking stuff now mind-blowing 
this has some good stuff, but they've taken it to the next level. I think everyone knows that they got the eye detection and everything, and it, it just it crushes it. And that's the reason why a lot of people are jumping over on that on that bandwagon. It's a little easier with gloves. They're a little bit bigger cameras, so if it's cold out. You still got the battery issue, but if it's cold out, the cameras are bigger, and so it does help. It's a little bit ergonomically with gloves. I don't like the ergonomics overall, but if, if it's cold and you need something big to hold on to, that's it. Obviously, noise, uh, dynamic range, all those things. Everything you see on the spec sheet, a lot of it is right. And the high resolution, no doubt. The high resolution, when you take a... 42 and 61 megapixel image with these cameras the Sony's it it uh, Yeah, it's it's good. It's got dynamic range great color depth everything works, but There's some reasons why I kind of I'm still going with with the micro four-thirds gear and uh, let's let's talk about that here in a sec here What do we got here got my list? Ah, so one in comparison I talked about the lens sizes. Now the Sigma 150 to 600, I have not shot the 200 to 600 Sony, but it's still the what I call uh, photography footprint. It's huge, it, it matters to me, believe it or not. So what I mean by that is I got a, a an image there of animal being scared. You've seen it from my hands coming up and, and all that, the silent shooting, but also the lens. The bigger your lens dynam diameter, the more flare you give. And I'll show that other flare video here in a sec. But yeah, it's 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 a real deal. The bigger you're, you're moving around and silhouetting with the camera, the more it scares animals. And it's heavier. Obviously, the size of the gear is, is substantially heavier. You know, I can get to 800 millimeter a Sony a7R 3 in crop mode will give me 18 megapixels about this and then the R4 gives me 25 a little better but we're talking probably twice the weight probably twice the weight and that's just you know that's not counting if you're bringing other stuff so it exponentially goes up and this is again this, these are all rounder cameras where you could take it on a hike and you're not going to be out of place you could sit in a blind you're not going to be out of place where I've been on hikes six, five, six miles. It does not work for me with full frame equipment. It just, you know, and, and that's just something to think about if you're going to be very mobile. I'm going to tell you, you know, if you're going in the camera place and you grab that, well, that's not too bad. You know, you're grabbing a full frame and uh, I can do this. It, it It's a different world when you're really tired going up mountains. And I went up Mount Albert. I'll show that image there. It's so about an eight to ten hour hike. I took uh, four thirds gear. Did not take my traditional stuff, and I was glad. I, I I wanted to even throw my other stuff out. It was so tiring. It just happens. You want light, light gear if possible if you're moving. Um, the other thing. So, stuff's cheaper. Now this is five hundred dollars. One hundred to six hundred. One hundred to three hundred. This is twelve hundred dollars. I think, you know, your telezooms for. For Sony full frame, man, you're they got world class glass. Don't I'm not knocking that, but their price you get what you pay for because their prices every lens seems to be over two thousand dollars, more like twenty five hundred dollars. And yeah, it's it's a little, and that, that comes down to risk too. You know, or do you want to take risks in in your equipment? Now, if something happens to this, you could probably replace this for five hundred dollars. If something happens to your A7 R3 or R4, you're talking twenty five hundred. 3500 plus glass you're talking five thousand dollars someone rips it off you drop it do something like that i don't want to take as much risk and that's what i was talking about the d500 dumping in a snow drift a lot more stuff going on with this i don't feel comfortable taking a five thousand dollar rig and just pushing it into a snow drift as i change lenses or something like that it's it's kind of like oh there's a lot of electronics a lot more than just a regular dslr yeah um I feel that Olympus has better software in their camera. Yeah, you know, they, one of the big things is obviously silent shooting, but you know, we talked about that. The Sony stuff has that as well. And let me see, two time multiplier is the big one that I love. Now, Sony does have something similar. Yeah, I think it's called their CLR I've used. It works really well. It's, it's about as good as this. 
uh, as good as the two times multiplier in this stuff. So I can take uh, 100 to 600 and or 100 to 300, 200 to 600. And I got two photos here and I'll show that. And that's what I do sometimes. If I'm short on distance, punching in the lenses and getting on there, I'll go to the two time multiplier in camera and this does it magically. It does it really well. I can hardly tell the difference between a native image shot at 600 and native in the two time multiplier at 1200. And if you keep the ISO low, two images you see, it's very hard to tell that one was, was shot in the way it was. And I use it a lot and it actually works out quite well. So again, it goes back to the software built into these cameras. Anyway, um, that is about it. That wraps it up. All good camera stuff. It just, some of the things you'll probably notice when you're out in the field shooting this, that, you know, micro four thirds can, can hold its own, you know, reasonably if you shoot it in the right conditions and you shoot every camera in the right conditions. But I think too many times people go into the camera store and, you know, they get swayed by that. Like people don't know, like Best Buy, Best Buy employees are paid by Sony, Nikon, and Canon. They have their own reps. So if you go into Best Buy or go somewhere, everyone's going to have their favorite, and they're going to sway you, like, this is what I shoot. This is this is what I shoot. But then you ask them, well, what about this other system? I don't know much about that system. Well, then you really can't talk that much educated about, like, what are the differences, if it fits that person. So, again, kind of going back to the basics here. If you guys got any questions, you know, um... Yeah, put them down in the comments. I'll answer everything I know. I, I've switched more gear and I care to talk about. Um, it's just, you know, wildlife photographers are, are probably at the mercy of anything here. So wildlife photographers talking with camera sales guys, we're, the, we're their biggest purchases. You know, believe it or not, they have a bad day. You have a bad day shooting wildlife photography. You go in and you try to fix it by like, hey, I want this autofocus. I want this lens. I want this. I want that. I don't want that to happen to me. I... I spent all day in a blind waiting for the moment and my, my gear didn't do what I thought it was going to do. So I, I, you know, I'll, I'll switch to Canon to Nikon and, and you hear people do that. I've done it. Oh, hey, we're all guilty of it. So again, if you've got any comments, concerns, put it down in the comments. I'll get back to you. I appreciate it. You can do that like, subscribe thing there. And uh, yeah, hopefully next week. See you next time.